Um, so, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much uh, for coming to our event. And um, on behalf of Asia Valor Advisors, we welcome uh, Mr. Luke Rebecca. Um, we're very fortunate to have the opportunity to host him today um, during his visit to Hong Kong this week. Um, Richard is the Managing Director of Collective Responsibility and a Visiting Professor of Sustainability at the China Europe International Business School. He's based in Shanghai and has spent close to two decades. <laughs> yeah, um, so two decades um, working on uh, sustainability in Asia, um, and researching and advising on projects um, of, of over 200 in total. Richard's focus is on how to build longer-term platforms for comprehensive economic, environmental, and social development. And we hope you'll find his insights both informative and actionable. So to start off with, um, our founder, uh, Phil Alto, will also provide a quick context on sustainability um, trends in Asia at the moment. Thank you. Did you get to introduce, introduce yourself? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Stephanie, and I'm, um, I'm a volunteer consultant at uh, Asia Valley Advisors. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Thank you for coming over today. Um, what we want to do here is that uh, among, you know, the, some of you we may have not met yet. A few, quite a number of you we actually have um, uh, first degree, second degree uh, connections. So uh, really the opportunity here is for us to make this as interactive as possible and to, to ask questions because the topic itself is very broad. Uh, and also, um, you know, we have quite a number of times. So Rich will do his presentation for about uh, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, then we will follow by a moderated discussion, but feel free to uh, jump in if there are some burning questions that you would like to clarify on. Then afterwards we'll have an open um, you know, discussion. So uh, what I plan to do here uh, over the next five minutes is to uh, briefly discuss about the Hong Kong context and also what ABA does because that's why we're having this uh, sustainability discussion um, on the back of Rich, uh, Rich's uh, visit here in Hong Kong. Um, a few things here is, let me see how this slide works, uh, is that Okay. Just touch the screen. It doesn't make sense. I just try to see if you do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the first part is that I wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge our venue partner, uh, Bridgeway uh, Prime Shop, for the venue hosting of this event. So that's the key thing first. So um, Asia Valley Rise is my, um, uh, I founded the organiz this organization in 2011. Uh, what it really is, is a, um, uh, it seeks to ins inform and inspire individual organizations to create sustainable impacts, which is why sustainability is a big theme here. And working with individuals who, um, who work with ABA and those organizations and clients for this. This is something that I've done uh, as a, prior to this as an investment banker. And I really want to see what are the ways by which I as an individual can uh, create sustainable impact and also professionally as well, in terms of the actual work, and also in terms of my own personal interest. So that's with the collective uh, uh, aspiration. So this is the thing that we have been um, uh, working on. This is a touch screen, I think. Okay, good, it works. <laughs> so over the last six years, we have uh, worked on a mapping study on the Hong Kong ecosystem. Uh, part of it is to understand there are individuals and organizations who care about creating positive social impact whether through their philanthropic activities, whether through their corporate CSR activities, or individually as philanthropists, or as impact investors. And each of us will have our own currencies in terms of doing good and doing well, profession pers uh, personally. So these are some of the projects that I've actually worked on, and we'll be happy to discuss a bit more during the moderate discussion with Rich about some of the observations in Hong Kong. Check. Okay, Hong Kong sustainability context, okay. Okay, in a nutshell, Hong Kong is a very divided city. It's a world city, but the rich poor inequality, the Gini as reflected by the Gini coefficient, continues to worsen over the last four decades, irrespective of the economic cycle, which means that for individuals and organizations wanting to, to make a difference and also wanting to do good, positive social impact, the reality of the matter is that the inequality has been worsening. So individuals who want to make a difference, whether as social entrepreneurs, whether as impact investors, whether through their corporate arms, uh, through their day jobs, they're finding it difficult to do both at the same time. And I think some of the themes we can actually discuss, ask Rich as well, 
what are the trends, are these trends in Hong Kong mirrored in other cities, in other countries in Asia, and also US. I just came back from a US trip, and I presented in Seattle to some of the philanthropists there. They have very similar issues in terms of rich poor inequality. The dynamics, the context are quite different, but the challenges that individuals face across their professional and personal life stages uh, varies, but the themes are quite similar. We can talk through that as well. Okay. Uh, each one of us, and Rich will go through this, when we talk about sustainable impacts, it's really about, it's not done in isolation. It's not wearing your professional or personal hats. It means that whether you are wearing your professional hats as a foundation, corporates, individuals, media, academia, social enterprise, nonprofit, each of these have direct or indirect, intended or unintended impact on sustainability social and environmental you know, issues and themes. And each of you may have one specific silo or hat or have multiple hats as well. So as you hear from Rich in terms of the, the observation sustainability uh, threats, I would suggest that you keep not just your professional hats on, but also your personal hats, meaning what does it mean to you? What are the ways by which you can do something meaningful with it today or learn about sustainability issues and then maybe pursue your own path later on. Okay, this report, okay, I don't know how to go back. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so I did, I did a, re a research report last um, uh, four years ago, uh, which is, was funded by a family office called RS Group, uh, which seek to understand who are the different players impacting the sustainability space. And the key takeaways here were that, and I'm going direct to the recommendation, is that even though when we spoke with different players, and these are leaders in each of the sectors, whether nonprofits, academia, for profit, government, uh, policy makers, what have you, we thought that the findings or the comments people will be sharing would be quite different. They will be speaking in their own respective professional silos. What we were very pleasantly surprised about was that when they share what are the cross-cutting themes and the recommendations, it's fairly consistent. And the biggest cross-cutting themes was changing mindsets. The challenge of trying to understand what is the broader context within which they operate, within which they create positive social impact. That was the common theme across the different sectors. So because I wasn't able to go back to the earlier slides, <laughs> The recommendations were as follows, and I'd link it back to the sustainability, which is, most people thought through this dialogue, we had one-on-one -on -one session, we had interview session, we had the online platform, we had convenings, small sessions, big sessions. Number one was fostering cross-sector collaboration and cross-sector dialogue. You cannot have collaboration without dialogue. You cannot have dialogue without a shared understanding of what are the implications of your respective person, professional activities, on the other sectors as it affects Hong Kong. And these things, when I shared this um, presentation in Seattle, it resonated with them as well because of the, the, the concept of understanding the social environmental impacts of one's work is quite, you know, something that people don't debate on. They say, yeah, that's an obvious point, but what does it mean? How can we move forward? So that's the number one thing. Uh, the other part which I would like to highlight on is focus on both social and economic benefits. The other three, maybe you can pass that for, uh, for now. I can share the slides later on the presentation. But the point here is that because as society progresses, we are getting more and more you know, uh, good at focusing on what maximizes our impact in our respective silos. Corporates, governments, everything is very siloed. Maximize impact on each silo, but globally, it's actually not. And this part, when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about uh, focusing on both social and environmental uh, impacts. It basically simply says that you are trying to understand the externalities, the footprints that you're creating, social and environmental footprints, intended or unintended. And through your work and being aware of the broader context of your work, even though you're maximizing your uh, silo you know, uh, performance, this is something that all you know, the stakeholders thought was quite important. And the last part, maybe I'm diverting a bit, is the greater accountability and transparency. This is happening with the advent of technology 
with the advent of basically mainstreaming of technology and how technology facilitates transparency, facilitates awareness as to what the players are and what they're doing and how they lead to the uh, to the impacts. This is also happening. So collectively, there are forces on the demand side by which people can be more aware of how they um, are impacting society, whether intended or not. I think that's basically it. And I will, mm -hmm. uh, this is my last slide. I think most of you, how many of you have not heard of the um, SDGs? Raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> okay, so we have all, but part of it, uh, I think the fact that no one raised their hands, it means that uh, this is purely a, uh, this is a one big step um, in the positive direction where it's one way of framing by which development, the DFIs, the multi multilaterals, mm -hmm. use this as a language to, to have facilitate understanding whether you're a private sector, impact investor, social entrepreneur, what have you, as framed by this. It doesn't mean that you have to follow this step by step. It just means that at least there's a language equivalency which is actually quite um, li um, missing over the last few years. With that, uh, um, Stephanie has introduced Rich. All I have to say is that uh, we've known each other for several years now. Uh, I think maybe five, six years ago. We had coffee in Shanghai and Ritz yeah. Carlton and thereabouts. We stayed in touch two it's years his ago. Budget, not mine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That wasn't, that wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> but he's wearing a suit. Yeah. <laughs> Very humble. Uh, we uh, hosted him uh, two years ago for a similar event, sustainability focusing on cities, and it was very well received. So I have the guts to invite him again, and uh, you will definitely enjoy hearing from him. With that, I'll pass it on to Rich. Rich. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said you're an expert. Yeah. Right, I can see all my slides reverse. <laughs> I don't know how to make this work. All right, so Is it thank you for coming, everyone. Um, so I'll just kind of backtrack a little bit, then add, I'm not doing that. All right, look, I come from the mainland, they're watching me. Um, <laughs> so I never am. Okay. It's always a mouse in the house. <laughs> um, so I've been in Asia, I guess my first arrival was 95 in Japan, fell in love with the whole area, and then after getting my MBA, I flew back in 2001 to Beijing, promptly landed, went, what did I just do? Uh, even though I was really well-traveled, I had not spent any time in the mainland. Um, had a plan of being here for one month, and I was gonna fly home, get my expat job, be flown back and live a high life happily ever after. Uh, that has not worked out. I'm clearly an entrepreneur, um, <laughs> given by what I wear and how I will speak about what I'm working on. Uh, I have three major hats that I kind of wear simultaneously. Uh, I am collective responsibility, which I'll talk about, and that's the corporate side of my life, the corporate consulting. I don't really know how many projects we've had. We're on the order of maybe 75, 100 clients at this point. And it really is, it's big corporate work, but it's also, we've worked a lot with entrepreneurs as well. And I'll speak through that, how we do that through this. I also am the founder of Hands On China. You probably know Hands On Hong Kong, uh, Hands On Shanghai, Hands On Chengdu, Hands On Beijing. Uh, this is all, I started that 12, 13 years ago. Uh, it was great, I went to the office for Hands On Hong Kong yesterday. I saw like how much it's grown since like the early days. Like, I was like, wow, okay, so it's, my hairline is worth it. Um, you know, the amount of impact that individuals can do, and that's really what the NGO side is. Managing 25,000, 50,000 volunteers has really allowed me to actually understand better what sustainability means, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. So through that, I run about 25,000 volunteers, 150 events in Shanghai alone. We operate somewhere around 10, 12 cities on an annual basis with our corporate clients primarily. Uh, and the last thing is I teach not just at Sieve, but sometimes at Holt, sometimes at SMU, and I taught a little bit at Poly U across the street, um, where I teach sustainability, responsible leadership, social innovation, like really just trying to get students anywhere from EMBA to undergrad to like just learn about what we're doing and find their own way. My mainstay was really Sieve's. Uh, I taught there for eight years. I'm still potentially teaching some electives, but I had the whole group of 220 on average and you know, I mean, honestly, I'm looking at this like, they're all your age, right? It's like all, but 
this was this, this was my elective course, the self-selected group. I also had the, the wider group that just hated me. Um, and you know, I learned a lot about actually how to engage people through that process because you know, when you're teaching MBAs who are looking to go out into finance, real estate, supply chain, marketing, whatever, you have to really learn how to create a language around sustainability. Um, that kind of leads me to my first. There we go. Okay, so we all probably start off here. Carbon is evil. Global warming's gonna kill us, and we need to save the polar bears. Um, and you know, that, that's a narrative that's really worked. And you know, thank you, Al Gore, with your beard and your polar bears, for putting us through the inconvenient truth cycle. And I think I don't know how many of you started there. Like it was, a, it's a very emotional thing. This gets to be logical, and this gets to be really intangible. Like you kind of know what carbon is, but you don't really know what it is. Some of you, I know, some of you, and your jobs have to go and count this, and then you have to report out. But look, you evil mouse! I'm just gonna flip you over. Oh, oh damn! All right, this will be on a recording camera. All right. So, you know, honestly, this is the narrative around sustainability. I think most of us probably understand, want to adhere to, but don't necessarily find it in our daily lives the best way to do that. And you might have conversations with people who don't even believe in global warming, and I'm not here to change that narrative. But, you know, if you're outside just using these three symbols, it's really hard to get going. And that's why I love really being, that's okay, I'll just use this. Um, so I really love being actually in Asia, and I'll show this in a second, but I asked 150 students last summer, actually I'm going to Taiwan to teach them again this week, what did sustainability mean to them? And I gave them a map of Asia, actually, so you're only seeing part of it. Like you can see, you know, the stands here, and you know, Southeast Asia's here, and this is the mainland in Mongolia. Okay, stop it, TV. I think it might be just like hand-waving. I think it might be like the DJI drone, like this is the early uh, software for that. But basically, this is what 150 students who are undergrad and a couple of grads said was what they were worried about. It could be waste management, illiteracy, this was ethnic cleansing in, in Burma, and you really had like the spectrum of personal concerns. I don't remember seeing carbon on here. Although I'm not gonna say that, and actually in our conversations, that would come up as like, yeah, it's really important we save the polar bears, but I got this in my backyard. And some of the, like you saw those two pictures of the, the people living in their, living in their house, I mean, you know, like they have a bed and a, a rack to hang their life on, and you're like, how am I going to teach that person to be, you know, you should really consider your water footprint. You should, you should turn off the tap when you're brushing your teeth. You're like, have you seen my apartment? Like, I'm just going to enjoy my little things I'm going to enjoy. And I just found that, like, that's kind of why Asia's been so interesting. Is it, you know, this is the development from 95 to now. Um, I looked at one of these pictures, the rest I totally saw off Google. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this is Pudong. <laughs> so confusing. You know, obviously, you know, you probably recognize this the best. And then that was Singapore. Like, those were the tallest buildings in 95. And none of those buildings in the bottom were there in 1995. And I didn't just moved from Singapore. So, you know, like, I stayed in the sale six years ago when the whole Marina Bay district was being built. You're like, wow. And they're going to close this, I'm not touching, uh, you know, going to close this loop by 2025. 20, like, the amount of growth here is phenomenal. And that's why I think, like, cities is the best place to be learning about sustainability because. It's real, it's in your face, it's at the time lapse in Asia where, you know, New York City is like, we're gonna build a building every 15 years, you know, like Shanghai's just like, there you go, Manhattan, and we'll multiply that by 10. And so, sustainability just has such a different context, because for me, what I couldn't understand is, you take away the polar bear, the carbon, the global warming, you take away the, the emotional things that we know we need to save, and you get down to actually the systems that we depend on every single day, and where they're failing, this is really for me what sustainability is. Like, the cities are just systems, and you break them apart. Like, energy, water, um, consumerism, food, you know, it requires shipping. Like, all these things are required for a city to function. And I remember being asked at one time, actually, it was 2010, when we had the Harmonious Society kind of moniker. Uh, we had the expo in Shanghai, and I was asked actually to give a speech on what is Harmonious Society. And I was like, well, Harmony City like kind of has a number of functions, and one is like it has jobs and quality of life and you know environmental sustainability. Like you break it all down, it's how do the systems function? Not just the physical things that we see, but also the social. Like when people move to a city, which they are by the bajillions, right? Like 
Every year, China adds 30 million people to the city. But India is now taking off. Southeast Asia, Indonesia is taking off. And we're just going to follow this population map across, you know, for the next 50 years. If they're moving to a city with expectations of a better life, you better be able to provide that. That's not PowerPoint. You know, at first people go in, they're, they're willing to what they, the Chinese call eat bitterness. They're willing to live in really cramped conditions, they're willing to eat crap food, they're willing to be separate from their families for, you know, 99% of the year. They're willing to put up with a lot of pain knowing that the next generation, the next year, whatever will be better. But at some point they go, no, 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 this is my city now. I'm not from where I was before. I'm not from that village. I'm from here. My children were born here. My parents are here. I'm trying to take care of them. They're expecting a quality of life. They're not going to be willing to put up with this for much longer. And this becomes a real challenge for sustainability and how I view it is how do you make sure that a city not only welcomes but manages and inspires its people on a day-to-day -day basis? You have to do that in a way that obviously involves an economy, but it's also a lot more than that. It's about like the person, the well-being, and I think we're starting to really see that um, when we talk about, like, you know, if you look at yoga and organics and all, like that's where the upper crust is now able to have those conversations. But there's a lower part that we're still like, what does healthcare look like for the 36% of elderly in the city? Who's going to support them? And that's where sustainability gets very personal for me and a lot of people. Um, why I'm in Asia, why I stay here, um, obviously besides the food, which is amazing, right? Um, you know, like the population bubble is here. This is uh, 2000, this is 2030, and this is 2050. And these are urban population numbers, right? So the problems are coming to scale here. You see it every day, you walk outside and like, I can't see across the harbor anymore. Um, the price of food, it's just amazing how much it's gone up. It's because the resources are either being wasted or used at a speed that we just we never planned for. We, we weren't built for it in many ways. And as we kind of cut across here, like these bubbles don't really grow. It's the ones that are at the bottom that are growing. So I actually feel like why well, I said sustainability is opportunity. If you're in this region, you care about this, and honestly, like we're looking at you know the, the, the latter half of the Gen X and then into the millennial generation. This is the future of business, in my in my like opinion. Um, you know, we're consumers now, like that's what we're all being driven to. And I'm gonna actually talk about like this from the back end of the animal in a sense, like one way that I look at sustainability now is actually at the waste, at the waste level. And I'm just gonna give a, I'm gonna follow one, two of the projects we've been working on recently around waste. And I'm just gonna carry that forward because next week I'm doing food, so I just wanna be different. But I'm more than happy to field any questions that you may have as I go through this. Because for me, I think sustainability can no longer be about Compliance, if you do this, then X, Y, Z. We have to find ways to inspire people to think more critically about their footprints, but at the same time build systems that don't remove choice. Like we can't say you can only have this because this is environmental and this is not, or this is fair and this is not. I know we can't do that. I know that's what a lot of NGOs and a lot of others are saying we need to get to. And as much as I may emotionally align to that, I also know logically it's just never going to happen. You're never getting people who can't afford a cup of coffee to go and buy the fair trade, ethically sourced, da -da 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 -da, lowest water footprint in a, in a compostable cup without a plastic this. It, it, they're just not going to do it. You're going to have to either build a system that allows them to do whatever they want, but they never exceed the limits, or you have to create a way that's like a consciousness around some of these issues. So I'm going to use mass consumerism as basically the starting point for this, the system, and waste. Because I, you know, I've, I've heard that if you follow the waste, you'll understand the whole system. So we've been looking at waste in China for about nine months now. Like actively, I've had five to eight members of my team on it at any one time. And you know, we've all heard of the Singles Day. So I'm sure all of you at one point or another have received an e-commerce box with whatever it could be, Amazon or Taobao or whatever, whatever's the local product. You get food takeout to your to your office, right, Philo? Every once in a while? You know, like those cups outside. Like we all, we're all so, guilty, so I'm not here to say like you're all wrong. But you know, like from the consumer's consciousness, like this is where we're participating in this problem. 
And we're the people in the room who care and who are in the know. We know there's a problem, right? But yet we still have these boxes, right? So I looked at plastics um, like three years ago. I got really angry at the ocean because it had so much plastic in it. So I started cleaning that stuff up. Um, and then we started looking at everything else. And so I'm going to give you like basically what happens in Shanghai. Now the interesting thing is while we were doing this, Hong Kong got inundated by all that garbage that was coming in from the ocean, right? And some of that's from Hong Kong and some of that's from the mainland, but at the end of the day, you can go anywhere you want in Asia right now, anywhere in the world, and there is shit coming up on the beach somewhere, right? Uh, if you're in certain parts of the world, you see it on the street, you see animals eating it on the street. Uh, when I was in Bali, the, the tallest thing on the island is the landfill now. Seriously, it's, it's the only thing that's been allowed to crack the coconut tree line. Uh, and there's 400 cows that live on this landfill just munch all day, right? It was the most ridiculous landfill I've ever been to. So in Shanghai, we followed it. Like we literally, like GPS tagged the waste. We sent our, our team full-time and interns because we believe that we should all eat bitterness together. And we <laughs> followed, you know, these thousands of recyclers around. We want to know like what happens to this stuff because you know it's coming out everywhere, like every building, go down to the trash section, and there's some developers in here, and like you have your segmentation, your separation happening, but where does it go from there? And we were really curious, like what happens to it? Now, it all sounds really horrible, but there's actually some good stories coming out. Um, you know, we followed these people around, it was really fun. Uh, for some of my staff, they were like a little bit weirded out, like, are we, like what's gonna happen? Are they gonna like make fun of us? Are they gonna yell at us? Like, it's all happened. We were taking pictures along the way. We took some video time. Like we just had a lot of fun with it, because what you see is like when you're in Shanghai, there's thousands of people, just like this one, picking up garbage, going through all the garbage cans, putting it on the back of a cart, sometimes in a bag, sometimes they have a truck. Like it was just there's this whole machine that you see that's going, and we mapped out the the entire sector in a sense, in essence. You know, like Shanghai and most of the mainland does not have any recycling formally yet. It's coming. But the cities themselves, they're just now coming to the point where waste is now a major problem, where they're actually having to think about these resources differently. Now, we have two bins on the street, but we have one truck. So no matter what, at the end of the day, it's all going into one truck, it's all going to one place. Landfill, incinerator, informal landfill, whatever it may be. But there's thousands of these opportunistic collectors who literally go through. And it could be the, uh, the cleaning staff in the building. On every floor, they'll go and pick it up and they'll start to separate stuff and they'll take it down the elevator and they'll sell it outside. It could be that person. It could be someone like we have um, full-time collectors actually living in my complex. We have like seven buildings, you know, and it's a Shanghai, so you know, you can figure out the numbers. In the basement, this family has rented basically, let's just say, three times this size. It goes back. And they're entrepreneurs. They rent the space from the building management. They take all the trash from the building. They separate it all out. They then go around the neighborhood with their tricycles. They pick up all the waste it's looking like this to all being enclosed in one facility. So they're actually cleaning it all up. And we saw it over and over and over again. One of the things that's moving this process toward the formal is because now Shanghai residents, and this is true in Beijing, this is true in other major cities, the residents have got enough wealth right now to be picky about how to protect their wealth. They don't want these people in their neighborhood anymore. It's dirty. My land property, oh, there's rats, there's cockroaches. They don't want to know where the trash is going anymore. Oh, this is a huge economy. And it's one of the most natural, rawest economies that there is. It's full of entrepreneurs. Um, one group we met, Waste Aware, I don't know, some of you might have heard of them in the past. They've got a kind of a global presence. They take plastic bottles, they chip them up, they turn them into clothing. Um, actually, my son's school clothing is, it's actually got a little Waste Aware tag on there. I was like so happy when I saw that because I know this group started by an entrepreneur. It's a legitimate company. It's not, they're not doing good. They're not like tree huggers. They're, I mean, they are, but they realize how to turn a waste into a resource. And it's really fun to talk to these people. Because the other day, like, they care about polar bears, but they're gonna solve it by fixing a system that they're 
pissed off at, they see an inefficiency, they see value, right? And this is what entrepreneurs do, they find value, they find the arbitrage, and they try to exploit it. And that's what these people are doing. Um, you know, you've all been here, you've all had Chinese meals that look like this, and you know, we've all seen that the waste is created. Uh, I just want to show this because we're just finished with a massive food waste study, which is we kind of went in kind of cynical, right? Like, like, oh, they just threw it, like, or it just all goes to the pigs. Um, the reason why I was looking at food waste is because China, this is 1975, this is 2015, 2013, this is the amount of pork that China consumes now on average. It's gone from about eight kilos per person per year to about 38, right? So pretty high, pretty big gap. Now, the rest of it, don't worry about for right now. You know, pigs require a lot of soybeans to be fed to them, and China can only produce a fraction of what they need. Um, they import significant. So they can produce 14 million tons a year. They require 90 million tons a year. And that comes from all over the world. Um, US, Brazil, and Australia are the biggest providers. And actually this was like my Green Monday hook last year, which is like, do you know how much water is embedded in 30 million tons of soybean? Like can anyone guess randomly? 30 million tons of soybean equals how many liters of water? So it'd be 300 million liters. Okay, no. Um, <laughs> I'd be nicer to you if you because you did organize this and we love you, but no, that's wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyone else? It's higher. I'll give you that. Okay, it's 90 trillion liters. No, sorry, 60 trillion liters. It's enough water for every American to take a shower for 14 years. Pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. um, almonds, in the middle of the California water crisis, they export enough almonds just to China for two years of showers for every Californian. So don't worry about your swimming pool, right? Like, let's, let's talk about food. And I hate food waste for this fact. I don't really care how it ends up in a landfill and how that's a nightmare. The amount of water that we're taking out of our aquifers is just, like you know, most of our aquifers in the world right now are coming out of lows. India is just a nightmare. The, Mid the Midwest is becoming a nightmare. The Middle East has been a nightmare for a long time. We're not making it better time we throw something out. You don't get that water back. It's not like, you know, I, I took a shower and it goes out the gray, and then like in Singapore they totally recycle it. This is gone forever. Like your hamburger has 3,500 liters, 3,500 liters of water in that one patty with cheese, right? It's never coming back. That one burger is worth 67 showers. So if you're worried about water, like just don't eat meat. Um, in China, what they love to eat. But China food waste has been really interesting. In the West, we lose about 60% of our food from a waste standpoint after we've purchased it. So we're lazy. We buy the bunch of bananas that we don't eat. They go brown and we throw them away, right? Um, name a category. The only thing that we don't waste globally is really proteins, um, especially in the developing world because you only buy protein, it's expensive, you tend to buy it that day, you know, it doesn't get wasted. But in China and in many other parts of the world actually, most of the waste comes before consumption. Consumption is about 30% of the total food waste. So, you know, we can talk about that, but this is where most of it is, it's in the agriculture. But we really want to follow the personal food waste to see where it went in China. And, okay, so my, my staff was really not happy with me telling them they to go follow these people. <laughs> um, this is nasty. And this is by far the nastiest stuff, because it's just bins and bins of food waste. And I took some pictures, pointed down, and you're just like, you know, there was a strong stomach for it. But what was interesting was like, this is the stuff that no one wants to follow. Um, I was asked the other day, like, why did Michael Pollan's books become so popular in the food? Like, people who didn't know anything about food also got so much in food sustainability because he actually went out and got the information and they learned how to tell the story. And he made it in a way that the average person in the room could identify the 3,000 mile Caesar salad. You could talk about how you take care of animals. You could talk about the farmers and how they love their product. And like he removed a lot of the hyperbole and went into the details. He spent the time on it, and that's where actually my staff has come up with some very interesting things. Like food waste now in Shanghai, they're formalizing, and we went and visited one composting, and this this one entrepreneur, he's not making money. 
uh, they're actually not sure that he's legal because there's no regulation around how you use food waste in compost. Like, he's not doing anything illegal, so it's not like the nefarious kind of like selling the cooking oil again and again and again. He's actually taking a full district, one full Shanghai district of food waste, off the government's hands. Because landfills are filling up. They've closed two of their five landfills in the last six months. They're just like Hong Kong. They're running out of land. He takes 60 tons a day of food. And he puts it underground. Worms, um, all kinds of like microbiome going on there. Uh, wood chips. And then he turns it into this, which is like this pure kind of worm poo liquid you know, hummus that he can basically put out there into the field. Those are his grapes. He's just testing the grapes because for some reason he felt like if I can prove that grapes are safe, then he can get all the approvals. So he's taking on all this risk. I mean, there's this is one of about five greenhouses that he's built himself. He is a migrant in Shanghai, so he's legally not supposed to be there to begin with. But he's proving that it works. He's proving that's safe. He took really nasty land like brownfield, and it's now totally clean organic um, soil. So he's rehabilitated the soil, which is another challenge that China's facing. Right? And the government's, they're not sure if he's legal, they're doing all they can to get him legal, but this is where actually the government and where big business is going, hey, you're doing something interesting, how can we work with you? And that's also why, like, when he threw the word entrepreneur in the title, I was like, we have to be a little bit more upbeat about this, because it could all go belly up very quickly. But they see a future, like, look, we, we don't know what's going to happen, but we're really optimistic that we'll prove that it works, and if nothing else, Let's find a way to sell the soil because we have 60 tons a day coming in and you know, they just pump it up. It takes like four days to rotate through. I don't know how he's processing it all. He wouldn't really talk about it, but you know, somehow he is. And so again, at the end of the day, it comes on the systems. And it comes on the systems, they're going to feed us at 2050. Because this isn't that far away. Like, we should all probably still be working in 2050. Unless I somehow managed to IPO out, um, or some of you guys IPO out, like I wish you all do. Um, but the reality is that ch the challenge that we face today, like it could be political, social, environmental, whatever, we're just getting started. Like we really need to get our heads around the fact that the next 35 years are not going to be easy. More people move into the cities, and right now we're maxing it. Like China's got a really strong series of systems. It has a government that puts them into place whether you like it or not, right? Find another place in the world that has got that much speed, that much engineering going behind it, and can execute on it at this quality. And I think most of us know it's just not gonna happen. So what's this going to look like? And I think that's why actually it should be a good time to be here, like spend as much time out in the city. I, I just love being out in the city, and like seeing everything buzzing around and going, what's going on there, what's going on there, what's going on there? And then being surrounded by great people. Because that's the other thing, it's like, it's all about your teams, it's all about your tribe, it's all about scaling out these ideas. You know, like, Sue, you're, you know, hands on Hong Kong, I just, I gave some love earlier. Um, you know, like, whether you're working on the social end of things, or it's a highly technical, how do you run a building side, like, it's, it's both. And we have to do it all. That's the challenge. And we have to do it before somebody worse than Trump gets elected. I'm just gonna say it, okay? Um, we have to we have to find a way to get it done right. And again, we can't remove choice. We have to find a way to make the economy work. We have to make sure people are employed. And I'm happy to talk about the future of jobs. We did a lot of work on the future of jobs. Really fun stuff as well. But it's just like following food waste. You have to just understand the system and then you can figure out how to fix it. But you can never point out the system is wrong, now go fix that polar bear as your solution. You have to really know what's wrong with the system, where is it seething, how to plug the real hole, and then go find the real system that's failing. Because carbon is coming out, it's an energy problem. But let's focus on air pollution, because we're in, we're in a region where air pollution is a daily topic of conversation. We can fix that. So, all right, so with that, I am going to stop, okay. You can follow me here on WeChat. I'm sorry, I know it's a WhatsApp land. Um, but there's my email and there's my Twitter, which is available here. All right, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm on all of it. Uh, we blog, we have like five blogs a day coming out, uh, or five blogs a day, a week, um, coming out on different topics. 
We have sustainability series. We have an entrepreneur series. That's all on video. So if you're tired of reading, this is our new moniker. If you're tired of reading, watch it on video. Um, so we're doing all of it. And basically the idea is like, everyone needs to start telling their story and what they're doing versus just resharing what they're tired of or what they hate. Like, just start flipping the scenario around. And I think that's what an entrepreneur, a good entrepreneur does well as a starting point. Then you gotta execute on it, but anyway. So thank you very much, Philo, again. My pleasure to be here. Happy to take some questions. Yeah. Thank anyway, you, Rich. <laughs> yeah, so we see the bottle. See, he, he practices what he preaches. We didn't even open this at all. And have coffee at the back. We use kettle and pass, no, paper cups. For those of you that are dyslexic, you'll know this is naive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what we'll do here is a moderated discussion, but um, in the meantime, what Rich has presented is, is a very... Uh, it's a specific example in China and food waste as an example, but um, the theme is uh, sustainability trends. We can actually be go broad as well. So maybe if there's any burning questions you'd like to start with, we can always, um, if there's none, I can proceed, but please, I'm sure there are some burning questions we'd like to uh, start with. Who's the brave one? Uh, start first, and yes, please. <laughs> well, early on, yeah. um, I think you mentioned about mindset, change of mindset. Now, I think that uh, when it comes to social enterprise or sustainability in general in China, if I'm not um, mistaken, I yeah. think the general general perception towards social enterprise or sustainability is still is is not well understood in China. Sure. And since you've spent a long time there, could you share with us about your experience there and also like what's the current status and how you think we could hopefully change that for a better group? So, okay. what's your name? And what's um, your but, um, I'm a friend of uh, 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 Phil. I'm uh, in education, okay. um, and so which obviously startup. is part of part of uh, sustainability. Um, so, yeah. I, um, you know, education could be for profit, non-profit. But yeah, sure. I personally believe in making impact and also making money. Meaning, it's for profit social enterprise when it comes okay. to education. Yeah. So, you know, like, we've had conversations about this. Um, I start off like, social entrepreneur is the Ashoka thing, right? Mm -hmm. And over time, I've just come to understand like all entrepreneurship is social, but then there's socially minded entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who really look at the challenges that I just kind of laid up there that we've all probably had discussions around, education, healthcare, food, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And I think that as long as you have a business plan for improving the process or the system or the product, mm -hmm. then I think that that somehow you can be, you can fit into the social entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a lower level of awareness around what the word social entrepreneur means in the mainland. Mm -hmm. But if you go and talk to ed tech, health tech, food tech, there's a lot of activity. There's a lot, and basically we, we worked with a very large uh, electronics conglomerate last year to understand how do Chinese entrepreneurs scale. Mm -hmm. And I went and interviewed probably well, my team and I interviewed 30 to 40 entrepreneurs who are Series C, like 100 million US dollar and above. Mm -hmm. And two of them, I remember two of them, I remember very clearly they were health focused. One was that, education focused. Mm -hmm. The three of them had very personal memories of how the system failed them, mm -hmm. or their family member. And I think that that for them was a mind shift. Like one of them actually took their, he was an Australian trained doctor, he took his father through pancreatic cancer in the mainland system, and he was like, this is broken, right? Um, I know a lot of families right now who are going, you know, I have a six-year-old, and they have their kids in education right now, like, this is broken, we're gonna burn this down. And it, <laughs> that, I think, at the end of the day, I think it's where social entrepreneurship and business should just become one. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've actually hated about social entrepreneurship, like, there's this myth that we're just better people. <laughs> Um, and that we should be given easier treatment or, or whatever, like awards. And they, I, I remember I've had several conversations about like impact investment overall. Like I, on some level, I don't get it. I give you an impact investment. I give you a, a social bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll take a three percent return. Mm -hmm. That's fine. What happens when KKR comes and give you thirty three hundred million dollars to go IPO, mm -hmm. and I I lose my equity? Mm -hmm. Like that sucks. Mm -hmm. And the impact investors immediately would sort of say, hey, wait a second, this is business. So I think, at the end of the day, I just look at the person. 
And if they've got a great idea, they want to solve a challenge that society's facing, the environment's facing, or the economy's facing, it's back them, right? And I think the more that we do that, the more that we celebrate those people, the better off we're going to be. And I, for me, that's my definition of social entrepreneurship. It's like, it's like, it's but it's not ours. one that necessarily is going to be, one, no. understood in the social entrepreneurship sector. In a sense, that's kind of where China's nice, because you can do whatever you want up there. And no one's really looking to put a label on you right now. But I think the one thing that's held social innovation entrepreneurship back is the NGO. Um, one, like before 2008, no one knew what an NGO was. And then after 2008 to maybe last year, there's like this cute thing. And then now it's kind of like no one really knows what's going to happen with new charity laws. So because there hasn't been the strong foundation of nonprofit work, the, the jump to the Gen 2 of NGOs, social entrepreneurs, hasn't really been celebrated in the same way as in the West or in other parts of Asia. Like India's got a really strong social entrepreneurship culture. But you know, when I go talk to these to these individuals, they're no different than some people I talk to in China. They just some people choose to call themselves a social entrepreneur and some people are just, just building a business. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Your name as well. Uh, and, uh, Harry. Yeah, my name is Harriet Beavis. I just moved recently from Singapore to Hong Kong. Um, so I'm kind of been figuring out for myself a bit of what's going on with social entrepreneurship, sustainability, who are all the players, what's everyone doing, and then maybe where I want to put myself in all of this. And I'm interested, um, you talk a lot about social entrepreneurs, and lots of the examples were like one guy who started off doing this, you know, he's trying to scale, he's trying to solve yeah. this problem. So how do you see that space of your individual social entrepreneurs and people coming in and backing them and helping them grow versus existing businesses, big companies that mm. are innovating from within, trying to change their business models. You have like sustainability teams, CSR teams within those organizations trying to make those massive <coughs> entities better. So like, what's your take on those, on that side of things? So there's so many ways to cover that. What I'll say is, in general, I and I work with a lot of big brands. Mm -hmm. I don't think they get it. I, I I've worked with a number of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world, and they have no idea what technology is about to do to their business model. It's going to destroy it. And I, I ran this. I remember our, we ran this workshop. It's about 18 months ago, with a very large pharmaceutical, and we had algorithm versus doctor debate. Mm -hmm. 45 people in the room, 15 health tech entrepreneurs. 30, like we're talking the global head of strategy, the global head of innovation for this brand. I'm sure you've all taken one of their tablets. Like, no, 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 people want to go to doctors. Like really? What about a five-year-old right now? What about a 15-year-old right now? One of my staff members literally got like acne medicine online from one random friend who said, you have to try this brand. And they had a bunch of like four stars. Or like the amount of data that your iPhone is going to start picking up about your health and it's gonna start telling you to eat a carrot, eat an apple, go for a run. It's gonna bust their model because people are trusting the data more and more and more. And the cost of healthcare is going this way. And I think in every industry, be it food, I think education's a great one. Like, I really think the university model is fried in 10, 15 years. For a large sec, not completely, but let's just say for the 40% of the people they pay the bills on. I think business travel, if I was working for Cathay, I'd be like, hmm, Skype is gonna kill me. Because I'm tired of lines, I'm tired of delays, I'm tired of da 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 right? And it's gonna be so good, like WeChat, WhatsApp, all these. So I really think this is where entrepreneurs are so interesting, because they, they, they get angry at the airport, they get angry at their teacher, they get angry at their doctor, they fix it. But coming back to business, I think some of the smartest entrepreneurs I've talked to, the ones who've exited at the highest valuations have gone to Unilever's venture capital group and said, hey, I have this product, I have this technology, I have this tribe, do you want to buy me out? And they get bought out at really high valuations right now. And that's how the firms at this global level are starting to shift. I know a lot of CSR and sustainable people and I love them all, but you I found very few who can change the business. Um, can start selling Trump here and saying like I work with some best brands. Um, I've I worked with a couple of really leading sustainability brands, and their sustainability people are fantastic. But it's really to see how they get blocked by the business. 
even the top brands you can name, mm. Patagonia, Interface, and that's when the emotional polar bear comes into the boardroom. But if you can somehow find a value of that polar bear that means something to the business, you're fine. But there's very few Yvonne Chouinard's, Ray Anderson's in the room. Paul Pullman is not an emotional person in that same context. He's very business focused. He's, he actually is the great bridge. But, and he's, I think he's a good model for going for Like You can really do a lot through that organization once he understands the business mission behind it. So I think that's the role of business. I think the role of business also, of large business, is that it will help the entrepreneurs who can't scale out of a single city, a single region, really go global with this. And I think you'll see a lot of that in education and food and healthcare. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of areas. Because you have, and I don't think we should be afraid of it either. I mean, what are brands good at? They're good at telling a story. Like if Coca-Cola bought a juice company and started saying drink more juice is good for you, they're by default saying Coke is bad for you. Let that message go out. Let them brand it. Let them take their name, like, and you can get so much more done there if you've built the right business. Mm -hmm. But the question is, if you're an entrepreneur building it so that Coke will buy it, so it's like Coke Light or something, and it's just dangerous or whatever, or you're just replacing the model just a little bit better, then maybe that's not the best. Maybe that's not what we should shoot for. But I, I think there's a lot of models out there that the entrepreneurs will start, that we scaled through business, and that will be good for the world. I'm happy. Hi. Yeah. Eugenia from Zoeja. Yeah. Hello, how are you? Hello, Thank you for all the likes, shares, and comments. <laughs> <laughs> I to see you in person. Yeah. I just wanted to pick up on your comment about corporate and also a little bit on uh, what Harriet was saying. I'm always curious, people, because um, you mentioned Patagonia yeah. and Jerry's and in, in the US and Taiwan and China also. Yep. There are multiple uh, corporations which are now people accredited. Mm -hmm. Would that be a tool to actually push or accelerate? The sustainability idea movement in house. Just want to see, hear what you think. So B Corp is a benefit corp, and it's kind of they get the uh, you get the benefits of charity in some sense, like foundations, and you can take in that kind of money. Uh, you also keep a bit of the structure of a charity, and that it's for the benefit of a community of something wider than just the, the shareholders themselves. But then you still have the shareholders. You're still allowed to sell your assets. You're still allowed to take dividends. You're still allowed to own it. Um, that's a good question because my relationship with B Corp is kind of changing. My understanding of B Corp is changing. Because we're in Asia, I don't really have a good feel for it. Although one of my good friends runs the Asia out of Singapore, and then my students were the first B Corp in China. So I'm kind of like, okay, I like you a little bit more now. Um, but I, I honestly, I kind of feel like. It's almost like impact investment. Why do we have to call things something else? Why can't we just say it's business? Why can't we just say it's investment? Like some investors really want to use social environmental benefit as their primary driver or one third of their driver for why they make a, an investment. And in part because I really want to believe that at some point all these things that we're talking about, all these B Corps and social enterprise, it just becomes the mainstream. And so I'm worried a little bit about if we start off like calling ourselves this, but then we try and go mainstream, what does that do? Now you're sellout. Oh, you saved all, you saved the world from disaster, you sellout. Like, wait a second, I'm trying to build something better here. And that's, that's my emotional challenge with B Corp impact investment overall. But if, if more firms pull themselves into this who are for profit, who are now the evil doers or whatever, right? Like you start seeing people pull themselves, and this becomes the main medium for business, then I think that's great. Um, I just, I don't know it well enough, to be honest. And it's not that I'm cynical, I just, I just don't understand it in some sense. I just, I'd like to know more about it. I also think that the main challenge is what's the legal basis for a lot? It's like it's a certification now. Um, certifications for me have always been a challenge. Like it could be organic, it could be lead, it could be whatever. Like there's a lot of room for error there. But if there's a legal basis, like there is I know, in the US and UK and some others, then I think that you're grounded in something very different than the certification. I don't know enough about B Corp to know like if it's an exact application. I don't know. And so that's so why I, I really don't know how to answer the question to say, say, I wish I knew a little bit more. Um, I wish we didn't have to call ourselves something different. 
and I believe at some point we should all be moving what emotionally as a B Corp into business as usual for me. Yeah. Any other more questions? So your presentation yeah. is a lot about like hands-on work that are city based and that's um, more you know, informal but you're also talking about your your, your answers just now, like mm -hmm. just on scalability. Mm -hmm. So how do like in, in which areas do you think there are common ground and rules for scalability across Asia, for example, and where oh, yeah. like whether you know um, big corporates or policy can have um, an impact on leading this further? So policy for me across Asia is always tough as well because the governments don't always like to talk to each other in the same way. Like, and all the context is so different sometimes. But I definitely think this is where like tech is very interesting for me. If you can create a technology that improves building performance, improves um, quality of education, healthcare, whatever, I think that there's enough similarities between the urban environments. So I've always hated the American lifestyle. It's the urban lifestyle. And I think if you're developing solutions, businesses, policies for what the urban environment looks like, like I just showed you like how pork consumption rises. That's all urban increase. And I'm sure if I went to India, if I went to Malaysia, if I went somewhere else, you'd see similar charts, right? Um, number of car owners, where maybe. If you plan for the urban consumption lifestyle as your framework, you understand the systems that are similar across the region, you're going to have a scalable solution. And I think that, that can be true of, for me, I think education, healthcare, really interesting spaces. Food for me is only challenging because it really it's so variant. But at the end of the day, like you know, Asia eats fish balls. Asia likes rice. Asia like like there's certain things that definitely are ubiquitous. So maybe if you're looking for real state, real scalability, you start with those. But again, like the systems are always so different. The culture is so different. The history is so different. Um, the business practice is so different. This is also where I think entrepreneurs they tend to be a little bit more localized, especially in this region right now. I do think that will change. I do think there's people who are cross-border and growing very successful at that. But I mean, again, like all of Asia's leading families all started with an entrepreneur, right? So how many of those do you have in Asia or in Hong Kong? How many do you have in Singapore? You know, it might be a dozen, it might be a hundred, but everyone kind of started. Like GE was founded by one person too. So I think at the end of the day, it's, it's the entrepreneur's opportunity to kind of figure that out for themselves and build the best team, build the best infrastructure. I do wish that there was a little bit more understanding. So if there was one thing I wish it would change, it's a little bit, uh, I was talking about the foundation for some of the stuff. I wish that more bankers understood the challenge that we're trying to solve. Because if they did, they might fund us differently. It might be easier to get funding. It might be easier to get equity investments. It might be easier to get like treated fairly in that sense. And I think that if I talk to a lot of my entrepreneur friends, like everyone will say, like, oh, we need more money. I mean. That's the easy cop-out in a sense, but it's true. Because if you're, we're working on a solar project right now. If you're a coal provider, you walk into your local bank. Um, this city has given me a license to open up a coal factory to provide power to one million people for the next 30 years. The bank goes, got it. I know the entire model. I know. I know the government will back you. I know you'll sell your rates at this. I know your cost is this. I know the whole industry. If you go into solar, like, wait a second, I heard that solar doesn't work at night. No, no, we have the batteries, but wait a second, I heard, like, they don't know the system well enough. So in some sense, like, you're talking about, like, new education, like, new technologies, new anything. You have to educate the market. And I think if there's anything that makes us have any disadvantage, like, any true disadvantage, it's just the general level of awareness of either the challenge that we want to fix and why it's valuable to fix that challenge. And then two, the value proposition for our solution. Um, that's the disparity. And I think when that actually is really well, really clear, that big business comes in and stops on our head. So we have to fight that process. Just to add to uh, Rich's point, and also picking up on the question about Harriet as well, about um, if one is interested in being a social entrepreneur or being more involved. Uh, part of it is uh, over the last uh, few years when uh, uh, as part of AVA's work, uh, Many bankers, consultants, law, you know, lawyers, uh, 
accountants who are really interested in shifting gears, learning about the space, uh, they are starting to learn more about it. And one of the challenges uh, linking into, uh, for example, whether a benefit corporation or accredited social enterprise is that the, there is the beginnings of a shared language across different sectors. What I mean by that is that benefit corporation or accreditation of social enterprise, these are just ways to sort of pigeonhole a certain organization that um, this organization is focused on social mission in addition to being scalable as a business. So there's a pigeonholing. At some later point, the pigeonholing, stereotyping, the branding of a social enterprise will lose its usefulness and relevance. That's okay, but at some point, bankers in the room who are coming into the space, who are shifting in and joining nonprofits or social enterprises or foundations or philanthropic organizations, it is that DNA and the mindset that when they get involved as a volunteer, as a consultant, as a, uh, as a staff, that that gradual awareness is uh, taking place. And I always say that for people that I have worked with uh, over the past six years and even currently, if they um, get involved in the space, volunteer their time, their resources, their connections, it is the planting of the seeds. But the fact of the matter is, as a model, as a, for impact investing or for social enterprise, it is very difficult. My own organization, I'm very, very honest, is a very difficult model to scale. But that said, the people who I work with coming in, the DNA for them to be aware of what it is all about, the languages that's being used in the banking space as it translates to the social space, it goes back to them. They eventually go back to the private sector, they become more effective leaders. And as they progress through their careers uh, within their corporate ladders, you don't have to explain to them why they need to invest in or support social impact bonds or development impact bonds or uh, having engagements that will tap into the younger, fresh grads of their co uh, companies that why is this motivating because it's actually a, a compelling reason why new recruits for corporations that are purely for profit to uh, attract them because these people want to have uh, a purpose whether they're working for nonprofits or for big corporations. So from that perspective, my own view is that I am bearish in the short term. It will take a way longer time, honestly, but I'm very optimistic over the longer term because many of these people, you plant the seeds, they still have to pay for their bills. They still have to raise their young families. They still have to pay, uh, you know, take care of their aging parents. But in the meantime, they take their time attending these events, attending uh, uh, different conferences, you know, sessions. It is implanted in them. Then they figure out what is the niche that they're good at. What is their value proposition, personal, professionally. Then they build it from there. From that perspective, I would say that I'm very, very optimistic. But in the very short term, this language, you know, sort of uh, this miscommunication as to what bankers think. There's a sense of, in, I'm an ex-banker myself, there's a sense of intellectual arrogance, I would say, that just because I'm good at my previous you know, job, that I could translate my skills and my knowledge into the social space. That's far from the truth. Mm -hmm. I, it was kind of like we're, we're coming up. <laughs> like, you didn't say that. <laughs> that's all, no, I, I say worse on TV. Um, but I was just like, you know, if that's your perception of the world, then don't complain about the world that you live in. Don't complain about air pollution. Don't complain about, don't complain about your kid's education. Don't complain about anything. Because that is the mindset that's creating these challenges. If you are saying, if you're empathetic with the people, like even if you can't change the, the, the situation, yeah, yeah. you're empathetic and you go in and you think about your like impact of your decisions, even if you're not changing the world, at least you're contributing in some way. And you can, that's one thing I love about teaching and I love about volunteering. Like, we are infecting people with the knowledge that they can have a, they can take further steps down the road. And if I look at my LinkedIn um, connections, the updates from my students, they're making much better decisions than when I graduate from B school and what my friends are doing, right? And not say my friends are shady or anything, but you know, <laughs> a lot of bankers in there. Um, but in reality, like they're, they're making decisions to go work in clean tech. Uh, they're starting up healthcare. They're, they're, they're working across, and they're, they see a different vision. And in part because now the middle class has grown to a point in Asia where some of the concerns that you mentioned aren't a primary concern to this group. Uh, obviously, 
you know, we're not going to get 100%. Like, it's just not going to happen. Um, you know, it's just, there is no Star Trek yet. We're not in Utopia. Um, but eventually, I think this is, we just need people to keep, to yeah. keep pushing. Like, I am actually short term, very much, you know, we're going to go through a significant amount of pain. And we're going to question everything about our politics, society, like, do we actually care about it? We're going to go through that. When we come out the other side of the chute, we're going to be much better off for it. Um, so no pain, no gain, right? And the only, the only challenge, like, if you're a social entrepreneur, you already see the challenge, just double down, right? Like, you're not going to go wrong with that. You might have a bad business model. You might be a little bit too early. You might not have built the right tribe. You may need to iterate, innovate on your product. But if you already see a massive gap in the market, go for it before Jeff Bezos or Jack Ma or one of the Quack family members goes after it because they will. It will be a very interesting business model for them. Um, Amazon is building a dorm. I was actually in Seattle, I guess, two weeks before you were. And Amazon's building a dorm for 500 homeless people on their campus. He doesn't have to do that. You know, like, no one in the town is going to kick him out because he's not doing enough for society. He just realizes, like, this is where it's shifting. And it, it's, it's, I don't know where it's going to go, but it's going to be a really interesting process. Uh, we have about five minutes, five, seven minutes left. What we'll do, we'll maybe take a few um, the questions in one go. Is that okay? I think you asked the question first. Oh, no. Follow and then, no, no, no. And then, yeah, the so we have the three. The three of you. Oh, you're sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you were talking about the context. So uh, if Can we you take, speak? Yeah, speak oh, sorry. Uh, if we talk about Singapore, so we hear, uh, I work in a social tech uh, incubator. Okay. Mm -hmm. We hear that social innovation is really uh, kind of praised in Singapore. Because of uh, thanks uh, to the government. So, how do you explain that? Uh, like, what has motivated the Singapore government and not the Hong Kong one in kind of similar context? <laughs> <laughs> what? I, I shot a video on that last week. Well, Shanghai, Hong Kong, or Singapore? Which one's the best place to be a social entrepreneur? I'll, I'll answer. Okay. Yeah, okay. Let's do it. I just wanted to ask about the role of failure. You know, in Silicon yeah. Valley, it's a badge of honor to say my first three companies failed, but you know, now here I am and super successful. In an Asian context, that's not always the same case. How how can minds um, minds and hearts change in that way, and particularly for investors to see failure as a as a potential learning opportunity? Um, one last practical. Um, so yeah. you've been mentioning uh, entrepreneur a number of times in your presentation or speech, mm -hmm. and yourself as an entrepreneur. Can someone not be an entrepreneur in the sustainability field? Um, if not, what sort of tips or advice? For someone who's got, you know, career. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to start with you. It's a little easier. And you're closer. Um, so I think at the end of the day, you have to be somewhat entrepreneurial to be in the space. Because, especially if you work in big corporate, you have to find, the, you have to spend time inside to really understand who are going to be your champions, understand the matrix, understand what, what, what they're worried about. And then you have to find a way to align that. Because your market is not selling out necessarily outside, it's more inside. Um, and I think that that can be just as difficult as someone who starts their own business to take the risk off. Now the nice thing is you don't have to worry about who's gonna provide you for your computer, you can call IT, um, you know, you have like all the, the, the infrastructure of business. But on some level, like if you wanna develop an external opportunity for it, you have to be entrepreneurial. You have to see where the, the system that your brand, your B2B is operating in and see like, hey guys, we should be over here because elderly is going to be the next move and we need to come up. So I think that you have to be entrepreneurial in some way, especially if you're going to be very market focused. If you just want to be compliance focused, then you're much better off being like the research, engineer, data driven individual. I don't think you have to be necessarily entrepreneurial for that per se until you're trying to fight for something that you really care about. Like if you're just doing something like your boss says, go get this certification, go do this, make sure we're compliant here. You're just project management execution. You don't necessarily, you can, you can just be a great worker bee, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to go and push your brand, push your organization forward, you have to find that next thing for them. And that, I think, takes a measure of entrepreneurial, like, tendency. You don't have to be the entrepreneur, you just like, you're the entrepreneur. You want to ex <laughs> exercise a little bit more than what your boss gives you, and that's okay too. And then maybe that leads to other things, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's just you're just helping the brand go forward. 
Um, then let's talk about risk. That's risky. Um, you might get fired. So what? Right? Like, update your LinkedIn, and within three days, you get 14 phone calls from headhunters. Like, I have a sustainability job. And like, right now, I've talked to so many sustainability people in, in Hong Kong that are all move, moving around. Like, there's a very active, you know, world around that. So, I don't think there's any downside to failure in some of these spaces right now, especially even the long term being what it is. And the fact is that value proposition-wise, what we're talking about here, clean air, clean water, clean food, access to healthcare, access to education, is becoming more and more valuable to more and more people. How can you lose if you know your shit? You might lose if you fail the tactic. You might lose if you're too early. But if you know the fundamentals of the system and where it needs improvement or where it's broken, where it's working right, and you're allocating your time to that, I don't think you can lose. I think that's where Singapore is losing. Um, so in a sense, like I think what Singapore did really well was the government threw a lot of money and a lot of support but go down there and talk to those entrepreneurs. See how many got off the island. Very few. And I know some lovely, some of the most inspiring people I know are down there, but they cannot scale their solution. Now there's a lot of reasons why they can't. And some it's geographic, or geographic, cultural, historical, some it's just, but what I found interesting is when I was teaching down there, the, the government released their their plan. I want, I'm so used to the five year plans, there's could, there's could be 20. And they had 40,000 elderly that they were worried about. And I was like, that's it? Like, you know, like, Shanghai one district, we have 200,000 elderly that we're worried about. But they were spending so much time, re they don't want to think and think and think and think and plan and plan. Like, just go outside and do. And that, I think, on some levels, with the Singaporean challenges. Uh, I had a friend who was in the recycling, he was doing a recycling project. He's, a, he's an environmental leader on, in Singapore. Say, I just wish the government would give me the data I need about recycling. Like, dude, just go outside and count. Like, go to the landfill, talk to the people, talk to the recyclers. Like, one of my friends runs a huge recycling plant in Johor. He takes just billions of bottles a year from Singapore. Just go and do the work. And I find that this is, you know, like broad stroke Singapore problem, but also broad stroke Sing uh, Shanghai sitting in office problem. Like, one of the advice I give to young people is like, do not take an office job. If you want to save the polar bears, whatever it may be, go out and get in the field. I mean, some will get paid nothing, some will get paid a lot of money, depends on like, how you want to do it, but be out in the field and learn real things. Like, learn who the stakeholders are, learn what the issues are, learn what the solutions are, and bring that knowledge back to your own organization as an entrepreneur or to an organization you work for in-house and then execute on that over time. But the more you sit in an office, the more you just talk to each other, the less likely you are to actually do something that changes the dynamic. And I think that that is a little bit what Singapore is struggling with. Like, and I, I, I don't know exactly why, but I know that when I was there 25 years ago, I heard the exact same thing then. Some would say it's education, there's only, you know, like four or five universities on, in Singapore. Some would say it's the fact that they're all wealthy, at least you know, on the, on the average level. There's a lot of people who have a lot of reasons. I just think that at the end of the day, if more of my friends who I, I mean, they're smart, they're well-educated, they've got great ideas, if they just got out of the office and did it, it would change that whole dynamic. Why hasn't Hong Kong followed path? I don't, I don't know why, I mean, it was always easy to register an NGO here. Um, for me, it was actually very, I was, I almost got posted here, um, and I told my wife, like, if we move down here, I'm gonna go to Disco Bay, I'm gonna take it off the grid. Um, you know, like, it was a perfect place to go and do, so the same conditions in some ways exist in Hong Kong as they do in Singapore. Like, you can do amazing things with systems that are not so big, like 40,000 elderly. In Hong Kong, it's like 200,000 that you have to play with. Like, you can fix that. You can really test, you can experiment, you can learn. Why don't, I don't know. Like, I think the honkies are just a little bit more, I'm just gonna get out there and do it. Mm -hmm. Singaporeans, not so much, I, I don't know. I think the other day though, you're gonna, if you want the problems to fix themselves, you're eventually gonna have to get up and get it done. You have to pick up the hammer, right? Okay, so uh, we're getting close oh. to the 2 p.m. mark. What we wanted to do is uh, we will be wrapping up and then I think Rich can stay here for a few more minutes for those of you who want to uh, stay on. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having Rich here. Uh, really appreciate thank your you. time. And, uh, thank you.
I haven't really offended anyone in my general stereotypes of what different you know, people are, but you know, I mean, it's it's really tough. I, I don't have a, that's a clear answer. Um, it's just it doesn't always work out according to plan. Maybe that's where the market should dictate more than the government in certain cases. Maybe the government should be more involved, like in this, in the mainland. I, I think at the end of the day, it's just like who's going to get out there and do it. And I think that's what if you guys don't then we're all screwed. Because I can't get the next 200 people who are kind of the, the non-believers, or the, the questionable believers, the quasi-believers, like, I'm definitely not gonna get down. So yeah. we need to figure out, like, what do we have in our backyard and what can we get done? So, I think the, fact, the fact that all of you are here, it's, um, I think, uh, just last uh, quick point is that the comment on failure and also the comment about entrepreneurship, um, it's more about the entrepreneurial mindset. And remember I talked about trying to put away your professional hat away and put in your personal hat. Uh, realistically, each of you have so much time on your hands anyway on a Saturday, Sunday, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, just figure out the social issue or cause or something that really bugs you or a personal experience that you have. And there's so much time and um, that you can actually make for yourself to learn about it. And that is a little trip in your mindset. And the question of failure, I mean, if you think about your life as assuming that you're 20s, 30s, or 40s, or 50s, it's more about you still have the rest of the 30, 40, 50 years anyway. So what's the point of you know thinking of it as a failure? Failure as it relates to an enterprise or an initi initiative or project, yes, you can frame it that way. But if you're going to live your life anyway for the next uh, 30 to 50 years and there are things that you care about, there's so much things you can do on your own spare time to really learn about it, to really research who are the other players doing what, what are the challenges afforded them, and you still stay in your day jobs. For those of you, for example, Shanghai makes sense because in Philippines, Shanghai, opportunity costs slightly lower. Depends on the context, of course. But in Hong, in Hong Kong, for example, many of people that I worked with and I actually interacted with, the opportunity cost is very, very high. Uh, for many of them. And I said, you really have to be very mindful of your opportunity cost, but if you think about it in terms of how they spend their time, there's a lot of things that they can actually learn from anyway, in terms of uh, that's the entrepreneurial mindset, in which case, failure becomes a non-issue, because something that you would want to do anyway on your own time, uh, without even getting paid. Yeah. Yeah. Audit your time and stop watching Lost. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Laura. <laughs> Thank you so much, appreciate it, and uh, you know, feel free to uh, stay around, but uh, there's still some coffee outside. Thanks for coming over. Yeah, don't waste the coffee, that's a water footprint, all right? <laughs>